Thanks very much. Welcome to my little Pictish world. Do we have my presentation? Okay. <clears throat> uh -huh. Okay, I changed the title of this so many times and uh, ended up pretty much summing up where I'm at as an artist, and that is creating something old and something new. Now, this thing turned up out of uh, an old cemetery in 2019. Um, a group called NOSAS, North of Scotland uh, Archaeology Society, were doing some work there, and they scraped off some of the topsoil and found this uh, wonderful thing. Now, my first impression when I saw it was that it was quite crude, and for that area of Scotland, uh, not far away from uh, Port Mahomic and Neg and uh, the Tarbot Peninsula, you might be forgiven for expecting something uh, quite sophisticated. But the more I looked at it and the more I've been taken on this journey by the stone to, to recreate it, uh, the more sophisticated it has come to appear. This is a drawing uh, by John Borland, uh, once of the Royal Commission on the Ancient and Historical Monuments of Scotland, now uh, retired from uh, Historic Environment Scotland, uh, showing... Um, the, the, the basics of, of the stone, you know, it's got uh, a couple of beast heads at the top, which are quite chunky, yeah, which, uh, which is interesting. Uh, a bit of interlace here. We can tell here that there is uh, missing interlace, and these three circles were my big clue as to how to recreate that. Uh, two interlace arms, and with this little curly cue here, which is all I had to recreate the rest of it, uh, which was pretty poor, this wonderful uh, zoomorphic a caper here, a panel of, uh, of interlace, which is suggesting uh, to me that uh, it was one of these Pictish stones, like, like the Nig stone we saw earlier, that had what the Hendersons called uh, a, a modular layout. And that's pretty much where the Pictish artist has given us a bit of everything in the repertoire. Um, over the other side, two uh, very big uh, Pictish symbols. Um, and overlaying them, we, we, well, we've got this diagonal bedding plane in the stone, and that's what's uh, kind of failed the stone in the end. Um, and this um, strange uh, grave um, inscription for uh, Hugh Macaulay. Now, when we came to raise the money to have this stone uh, conserved in, uh, in Dingwall Museum, um, I wrote to the Clan Macaulay Society, and I said, Oi, you lot have purloined this uh, early medieval stone, so uh, get your checkbook out. And they, they did. They sent us a thousand pounds. Yeah, towards the 20 grand target. So yeah, it was a cheeky move that, 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 that paid off. So good, fair play to them. And then uh, underneath here, we've got some, uh, some classic Pictish stuff. We've got an, a, an S beast here being used as a bit of a, shape, a space filler, which the Picts are really, really good at. Um, the strange dog-headed man with his sword and his shield that we see uh, elsewhere, particularly uh, from Orkney. Uh, a centaur. Um, uh, uh, appearing here, and then we've got these strange dog-like animals above a couple of cattle. Now, what I've got there then is a lot of clues as to uh, as to how uh, I could recreate that. The sides are, are also pretty good, but fairly crude. Um, although this wonderful um, sort of weave, yeah, of uh, of pattern here um, is 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 a lot better than it that perhaps originally looked. Now, what what I normally do, or what I started out doing, I didn't always used to be a stone carver, right? I did lots of other things. I was a, an executive for an American software company until uh, 2014, so I had 20 years uh, working for a California-based company until I, I could bear that no longer, and um, <laughs> went to do something a bit more real. Um, so this is the kind of stuff that I did. This was my first major museum commission, and that was to recreate uh, the Money Feath Cross that I've, I've uh, carved through in the, in the gallery. You'll recognize um, this, this, perhaps. So this is both sides. So carved as new, so as if it, the, the, the carver has just, uh, just created the thing. Um, this is one side of one of the Kiri Muir stones, so trying to bring it back to life from the very worn uh, original uh, that we have uh, and trying to, um, yeah, trying to recreate some of that style of the, the, the big eyes and the, and, and, and the solemn features of, uh, of early medieval art. And this was a recreation I did for the Forestry Commission in, in, uh, in Scotland of uh, Sweno's stone. And uh, it's about as gruesome as you can get, right? There's lots of uh, battling going on and a bunch of lads who've lost their heads, you know, which are all in here and blowing trumpets because that's what you do when you chomp people's heads off. So, um, yeah, great fun. That's the kind of stuff that I do. And then... You know, I've done lots of little carvings. Little carvings are great. I've got no patience. So something that you can start in the morning, select the stone, carve it, uh, finish it off. It's on Facebook by tea time is, is great, right? But um, 
Much more interesting is when you do a, a, a bigger carving. Anyone who does pieces that take multiple days to do will understand what I'm talking about here. But you do a little bit every day and it tests your patience and it teaches you patience, I find. Um, and these are uh, some of the bigger pieces that I've done. Um, the one on the left and the right are the same stone. This is my first major public monument um, unveiled in 2017 at Fort Eviat in Perthshire. It commemorates uh, the life of King Kenneth MacAlpin who was traditionally thought of as the first uh, king of the, the Scots rather than the Picts, but really wasn't. It was really his, um, uh, the time of his grandson, uh, Constantine, who, who, who was really seen, uh, I think, as, as the first uh, Rex Scotorum rather than uh, Rex Pictorum. Um, another great Pictish centre near where I live is St. Vigens at Arbroath. It was a great honour to have a, a, couple of, uh, a couple of pieces there, including this one. Uh, I made the mistake... Uh, of carving to St. Vigen Aberbrothic and to St. Bride Pan Bride, which I've seen actually uh, published somewhere as being a traditional text, but it isn't. I made it up. And that's taught me never to make anything up that you put on a new stone, because people will think that you got it from somewhere uh, ancient, but I just, I just made it up. Um, this is me in my workshop, um, working away on a stone that I uh, designed uh, and carved with my apprentice Tristan uh, for Brechin in Angus. Uh, th these were a pair of stones uh, that are going to be part of a new new Pictish trail. So very different. This is really um, it's a, it's, it's a bit uh, a bit of a strange carving. It's a relief carving carved in fairly high relief, um, but with a, very much a, a class one or incised flavour. Yeah, with the uh, the Pictish beastie uh, and and the salmon, um, which is one of my my favourite pieces. This is much more rich. It was designed to look a bit like a carpet page. It's got lots of. Um, uh, you know, morphing from interlace um, into into key pattern, and uh, this was all designed completely freehand. So I, I didn't even put a grid on the stone. I did use a ruler, um, but I, I just drew it all, and myself and my apprentice went uh, went hard at it. And this is the the finished stone. So it's got a, a couple of Pictish symbols, a new Pictish wolf, a facsimile of a cup and ring marked stone from a hill that overlooks Brechin. Um, and then I've, I've played around with it. I was talking to Cynthia at the time, right? Cynthia's to blame for some of this because she put it in my mind, this idea of uh, interpolation uh, uh, of motifs and morphing from interlacing to key pattern. I couldn't stop thinking about it um, and I've been doing it ever since. So I'm morphing into key pattern here and it's all vaguely coherent. Um, I, I, I call the, my method for uh, designing interlace a kamikaze method. Um, because I just go at it, and uh, as you get towards a corner, obviously the pressure increases, um, <laughs> and therefore every corner is completely different. <laughs> so, uh, you know, no, uh, yeah, the George Bain's book wasn't used uh, to, do <laughs> to do my interlace, and it's a lot more fun, right? So, uh, and these are the two, uh, the two monuments uh, in, in position. Now, back to Conan Bridge. So, 2019, um, it's discovered. We pay for to have it conserved. We raised all the money thanks to the Macaulays, and, um, and then 2020, uh, it was put on display in Dingwall Museum. And then I was asked by Highland Council if I would carve a replica. Great, that's what we do, right? So uh, absolutely delighted, and originally the plan was to take that top four feet of stone that we have and recreate it. And then the remaining four feet, so it was, we, we decided this was the, the, the height of the original monument, it was about eight feet, we'd leave completely blank you know, museum style, to show that we didn't have that. Um, that was the original plan. That would have been really tidy and we would have finished it really early and instead we finished it really late and it's, uh, it's a lot more elaborate. So we, we decided to recreate the entire monument, which is like the ideal commission because we get to recreate what we've got and we get to reimagine what might have been there by looking um, at other stones in the area. Uh, John Borland, who I mentioned earlier, uh, is, uh, helped me a little bit with uh, some of the drawing to get the scale right and things. So this is one of John's drawings, one of the last uh, things he did, I think, after, uh, before he left the Royal Commission. Um, yeah, so we have at it. This is the original piece of stone. About 8, uh, 0.85 tonnes, that's it in my workshop, although obviously it's the other, other way up. Um, and uh, a lovely big lump of St. Bees, or so I thought. Ah, so, about five days in, uh, I discover this. So, uh, normally when a stone arrives, we hit it with a hammer, and you can usually tell if there's got a fault in it. It actually had, like the original, uh, a diagonal bedding plane that ran from the top of the stone right the way down to the bottom. So, 
uh, it was a dud. I, I, people imagine, I think, that I go to a quarry and I say, oh, yes, I'll take that one. And, and, and of course, that's not the way it works. Very few quarries are able to produce uh, stone at this sort of size that's good from one end to the other. And they'd much rather, most of the time, chop it up into smaller bits and sell it. They'd make more money. So it's quite hard to get hold of stone. Um, but this was, this was particularly bad. So I soldiered on for a while and then realized that nah, I had to go. So that one went back to the, <laughs> went back to the quarry. And this is the second uh, stone being brought in by JCB to my workshop in Angus. And this is me drawing again. And this is it. It's a wonderful moment I always find before I start, uh, start taking a chisel to it. And this is the end of day one. So this is me uh, recreating uh, the two big symbols at the top of the stone. Um, this is a couple of days in. I'm starting to contend with the centaur and the, uh, the dog-headed man. And then this is pretty much getting to the, the limit of what the stone tells us, right? And this is where it gets interesting. This is my apprentice, Tristan. Tristan is the most competitive person on planet Earth. He's a former professional ice hockey player in Canada and America. So he's quite an interesting guy, but he is uh, always determined uh, to keep up with me. So he'll be on one side of the stone, I'll be on the other. And Tristan's trying to keep up with me, and of course I'm not having that. So um, we get through work fairly quickly as a, as a result. So we're starting to carve you know, these dog figures and getting down to the nitty gritty of what we're going to put below uh, the cattle. And this is where we look to the existing um, body of work that's out there. So what, which stones have a similar kind of program? Pictish stones are never exactly the same, right? The, the, the Picts um, valued novelty in, in their art above all else. So um, we had to do an awful lot of thinking. The very obvious thing to do is to, uh, is to do a hunting scene which would be consistent with other stones that have a similar program of work. So that's what I went with. So, uh, and using Pictish devices like filling space with, um, with animals that, 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 that are, that are modelled uh, to fill the area involved. So that's pretty much side one, right? All finished. And I'm thinking side two is going to be easy, but I always think side two is going to be easy. Uh, and it isn't. This is me carving the, uh, the side of the stone um, with this interlaced panel. One of the interesting things I, I, I'm doing is a, a project with um, University College in Cork, uh, looking at the effort spent on pretty much the entire corpus of carved stone in Ireland. Um, and my input is to, to give an estimate as to how long I think a, a thing would take to carve. So I would um, do things like time uh, myself doing 10 centimetres square of, of interlace and working out, therefore, you know, how long it would take to carve a stone, which is something I hope is going to be of use to other academics in the future going forward. Um, this is the stone coming out of my workshop. The last thing you ever want to do with a, you know, a ton of stone is move it, uh, but move it we must. Not quite sure what I was expecting to do with this hand here. Uh, <laughs> sort of steadying it. Yeah, moving it along there. And, uh, yeah, how do you turn it? How do you turn it? The very first one we did, uh, I didn't have a clue and uh, just kind of put it out of my mind <laughs> until I'd finished the side and I had to address it. So what we do is we get uh, two JCBs. Sorry, I flicked ahead there. Let's go back. You get two JCBs and two drivers that you trust <laughs> and, and two long straps and you lift them up like that and then you move the JCBs around like that and the stone rotates within the straps when it, when it works well. Um, yeah. And I won't show you the video because it gives me a heart attack when I'm, when I'm <laughs> watching it. Um, this was my uh, initial drawing yeah, for, uh, for this side of the stone, the cross side. This stuff's pretty easy to carve, right? So um, we get on with that and then we try not to think about what we're going to put in here. And this is where you've got to get the books out, right? And look at the entire corpus of Pictish Art, looking for similar uh, programs, similar treatments, of things like the, like, like the beast. So you can see here, uh, this is Logie Rate 2 um, with its, its S beasts, which are kind of similar. And the chunky interlace is, is sort of a reference to this as well. The other side is very similar, you know, two great big Pictish symbols at the top and then some kind of narrative scene underneath uh, which may or may not involve a hunt and may involve cattle and certainly involves dogs. Uh, so that was a good, uh, a good hint. Um, this is in Dunrobin Castle, uh, this particular stone, Golsby. It's got a lot in common with my stone, and it's not really that far 
uh, from uh, Conan Bridge. And one of the things I love about this, so you, you see the modular style that the Hendersons talked about, where there's a panel. It's a bit like Ruth's project, you know, those individual panels um, making up the, the stone ar around the, the main message or the cross. And what I particularly loved about this stone is this wonky key pattern, right? The Picts seem to love that, that thing of um, going a bit off, off piste, you know? and then sometimes bringing it back at the end, back into something a bit like coherence. Um, so I loved that. So when I uh, did the key pattern on this stone, I, I, I tried to do something kind of similar. And again, on the other side, a couple of big Pictish symbols at the top, narrative scene, figures, animals, uh, people uh, walking like this, which is great. Um, and this is my, uh, my interpretation of, uh, of all of that. So... These, again, were some of the stones that I, I studied uh, in order to come up with a program. So I'm not trying to carve the stone and say this is exactly what it looked like. I'm saying the top section is pretty much yeah, what you would have seen. The bottom section is in keeping with other Pictish art. So it's my suggestion as to, to what it would have looked like. Um, this is the Drosten stone at St. Vigens. And these two are, uh, are, are Nick, one of the, the, the greatest monuments in the, the Pictish uh, canon. Um, and again, this modular approach um, to uh, pretty much giving you a bit of everything that the Pictish artist has to offer. So this was, uh, this was progress. So uh, I carved these fairly quickly, to be honest. Um, and a lovely double strand um, interlace, which is great. And I'm starting to think this monument's got more to it than I, I originally thought. Uh, the centerpiece was nothing to go on, really. So this one I just really made up. Um, and then this panel here was fabulous fun to carve. It's probably the most sophisticated on the stone. Um, this is it here. Um, and and I, I had to, to draw pretty much from tiny little clues, yeah, what we were getting in terms of that interlace. So this is it coming together, right? Starting to get pretty rich, starting to get pretty, uh, pretty excited about it. This panel's very simple. These were much more difficult to carve. You'll remember from the original drawing, there was a, a suggestion of three circles in here. So I built my interlace, yeah, out of those three interlocking uh, circles. The kind of bow tie thing going on here. Um, was pretty clear from, uh, from the original, so that's what I went with. Um, this is kind of my process of how to recreate some of these panels. So um, this was John's drawing of what he could see, so he's trying to record what he sees. Uh, this was Craig Lowe, uh, a, a New Zealand artist, a friend of mine asked to help me out a little bit. This was his interpretation of it. Um, I then take it, get it on the iPad and use uh, Procreate. Um, so a bit like Ed, I'm using, I'm using uh, some technology to recreate it. And this was my recreation of that zoomorphic panel to try and make it uh, make sense. Now, this should be a video. Yes, look. This is me carving at actual speed to keep up with Tristan. <laughs> it's great. I could watch that all day because I know that that took me 45 minutes. So this is my process of carving in and rounding off. It's not really very complicated uh, stone carving, but this is, uh, this is me digging in. So that's, uh, yeah, that's a lot of fun. Should we watch it again? Why not? <laughs> Tristan would be trying to keep up with us, you see, on the other side of the stone. Yeah, great fun. Isn't technology great? So uh, this was the, uh, the left arm. So if you remember, I pointed out I had this little curlicue a little tiny little bit of interlace. So from that, I extrapolated all of that. And it kept me awake at night for uh, several weeks. Um, so yeah, that, that, was, that was a horrible job. But we got there in the end. Um, this interlace, so we've got down to about, boy, maybe about here. Yeah, so this is a replica. And then from here is imagination. So I've borrowed some things from different stones. There's a little bit of neg in here and here. Um, and I'm just playing around and just going through the repertoire. And then I've morphed, again, uh, for Cynthia's benefit, uh, I've morphed from my interlace into this uh, key pattern with the S shape in the middle. And I'm just having the best fun, right, in the world. And the best thing about it is no one can say it's wrong, right? Because it's, it's somewhere in the ground. Don't they ever find it. So um, this is the completed cross section. And this was my wonky key pattern, right? So remember Golsby, where the, the Pictish artist hasn't used a grid, he's freehanded it, uh, and it comes together in the end. And it, it kind of works, like Les Dawson playing the piano for those uh, English people in the audience. Um, so I've started off, it's all nice and coherent, and then I've just 
changed key and gone into a bit of a jazz thing here, yeah, and then brought it all the way back into, into the key pattern. And I was really chuffed with that because, again, I was worried about it. And that's it. This should be a little walkthrough. My feet are in most of my photos of this stone because uh, that's the way it works. And this is uh, just covering the whole, uh, the whole of that side. And as you can see, it's way more sophisticated a thing yeah, than it originally looked with those two big, uh, big dragon heads. Let's just do that again. So wonky key pattern, S-shaped uh, key pattern in the middle here. Modular approach to the, the outside of the cross. The two protective beasts yeah, at the top. And that's it. This is the completed uh, monument. The next slide should be a picture of it <laughs> at Conan Bridge. Uh, this is both sides. So, uh, yeah, nice to see both sides because obviously once I've turned it over, I don't see the other side again until we install it. Uh, but the coherence is what I'm looking for on the narrative side. The richness is what I'm looking for on the cross side. And this is where it's supposed to be. But councils do strange things, don't they? So one part of the council commissioned it. And the other part have built a gate <laughs> stopping us getting in to install it. So that needs to come out and uh, we need to come up with a different, uh, a different method of installing it. So, like I say, welcome to my uh, little Pictish world. Um, it's been a fantastic project uh, from start to finish, uh, I think, because we haven't finished it. And uh, thank you very much indeed. So thank you very much, David, and uh, you know, good luck with all your future uh, commissions. You know, because I'm sure that in the end, actually, Scotland will have more of your picture stones in it than the originals. <laughs> <laughs> so, and I'm very tempted by the ones you brought with you. But uh, <laughs> um, I wonder now if we could actually have uh, everyone up for some questions. Would that be okay? Because we we couldn't do that um, uh, before lunch. So if I bring some chairs up, perhaps you, anybody, everybody who is with us this morning could. Taking that up with you? Yeah. yeah. There's a lot of us. Thanks very much. <laughs> Great um, morning and afternoon of, of talks, and uh, so I'll just open it up to the floor. To uh, if you have any questions, I'll pass the mic round. I see your hand going up, <laughs> and uh, we've got about um, maybe 10, 15 minutes before we head up to the cathedral. For Michael, uh, development of key patterns over the course of time. Anything of recent vintage happening with key patterns that you've uh, you've worked on in my in my own projects? You mean in anything? Have you seen anything new? Uh, I've been uh, I've been experimenting a lot with uh, transmutations as uh, for my work with Cynthia, and uh, so I've I've been experimenting a lot with the, uh, the setup of the grid. Um, I saw that David. Kind of, kind of winged it on his wonky parts, uh, and I, I found that fascinating because I, I was looking at it, seeing the grid being very regular, you know, on a very, very small scale, and then suddenly enlarged to to a to a larger 
could be done on a grid or it could be done uh, freehand. Uh, and I, I, I've been getting a lot into that because it, it's, it's once you've once you've mastered the basic layout of, of triangular keys or whatever or mazes, um, it like anything else, it becomes old hat, and and you want to challenge yourself and and, and make it fresh again. And and so I, I've been trying to. Um, to see how how the grid could be uh, affecting the transitions, and I found that you can lay out the same uh, the same uh, number of units in a grid, but how uh, how you lay in the the trunks or the, the main cross grid lines uh, can be done in a couple of ways. You can you can do them uh, very short on each five dot pattern, or you can connect three dots in a row. And if you if you do it on the larger scale, it gives you uh, larger diamond shapes that you can then have more room to, to have more t twists and turns on the inside. Whereas if you do it on the smaller scale, you're more uh, limited to the, uh, the traditional, you know, uh, triangular keys. So, uh, so I've, been, I've been working a lot with, with, uh, with the grids and how, how the grid can be manipulated uh, and how that affects the, the finished product. Uh, for Stephen, you know, <laughs> you're on to this mystery and discovery. Is there any other projects that might follow up with that? Uh, yes, there are. Yes, there are. Uh, testing, testing. Um, you know, having looked into Michael O'Connor and having found um, a number of his works, it brought me to Listowel, obviously. And I've discovered that Listowel is really a hot pot of, of contemporary Celtic art. Not contemporary Celtic art, excuse me, but Celtic revival art. And over the last 150 years, there have been plasterers, there are people who have worked in repousse work, there are people who worked with pins and wire, I mean, making extraordinary stuff. There's about 10 other producers over the last 150 years. And you're talking about a small town of about four to 5,000 people. So it's not like they're coming out of Dublin and you've got 10 producers. They're coming out of this little hot pot. And uh, I, 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 I don't really hesitate to call it the, the world's capital of modern Celtic art uh, because of the amount of different media that have come out of... Uh, the amount of Celtic art over different media that have come out of this doll. Um, over the last 150 years. I mean, some of it is Gaelic revival. It can mix in with Celtic art. Some of it, uh, uh, sorry, all of it is done out of passion. And that's not just from a professional sense of, uh, 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 you know, they haven't, they weren't really commissioned to do all this. This is stuff they did when they came home and, uh, and did it in their spare time. And yes, th that's, that's a, a, a project that is going to, be on my radar over the next five six years um, you know I hope to expand on that and perhaps write a book on it who knows well I have actually been told to write the book but Thank I you. have to get over the Michael O'Connor part first Um, so the truth is I have questions for everyone, burning questions, <laughs> but so if I don't get, I don't want to be greedy, so if I don't ask you now, I'll come for you later. <laughs> um, I, I have a question for Michael Carroll. Um, the, the, I was wondering if you have thoughts about, there's kind of big family groups, I suppose, of square key patterns or orthogonal key patterns, in addition to the ones that show up on Roman mosaics, and I was wondering if you have thoughts about how they fit into the chronology along, you know, of diagonal patterns. Yeah. Uh, it's interesting. I, I, uh, being a, a devotee of J.R. Allen, I've, I've kind of concentrated on the diagonal patterns more than the orthogonal. Um, but uh, obviously the, the orthogonal ones uh, came earlier because we have examples of those in, in uh, Greco-Roman art. Um, and they, they do appear in, uh, in several, pla several places, both in the stones and, and the manuscripts, uh, as well as the diagonal. Um, I, my thought is that the, the, it's more the preference, the insular preference for the diagonal uh, that tends to, to 
lead them to, to, to you see more of the of the, uh, the diagonal key patterns than you do the orthogonal. Um, but I, I think it's uh, it's probably uh, I, I would think the er I, I would have expected the earlier uh, the earlier pieces to have the more orthogonal and the later ones to have the diagonal. But uh, I, again, I haven't uh, I haven't concentrated a lot on the orthogonal. Uh, my own research has mostly been in, in, in the, uh, the the diamond patterns and the uh, and the diagonal. But I think they, they, they both operate out of the same uh, the same principles. It's, it's just you're you're just turning the, the square this way or this way, and you still have the four points at which you can bring the lines into the to the maze. So. Uh, it's really the same thing, just uh, just turn around, uh, and the only the only difference really is when you turn them around, uh, you get those triangular blank spots on the on the sides. So uh, it, it's kind of they're kind of uh, two sides of the same coin, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> I'd I'd just like to make a comment. I'd just like to. Uh, thank uh, Stephen so much for resurrecting Michael O'Connor. It seems to me uh, the equivalent in the Celtic revival world of opening Tutankhamun's tomb. So thanks very much. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, it's been a pleasure. Uh, it's Like I said, it's been, it's been discovery all, all the way from Michael O'Connor and the works of art to my own discoveries uh, in what I enjoy now and uh, yeah very interesting four years so far and there are many more years to come in it there's no two ways about it thank you uh, this mess or this message goodness um <laughs> this question is for David um I know you mentioned you're working with university to sort of try to determine the timing it would have taken to create all the Pictish stones. Um, are you using the same type of techniques and tools? Obviously, there's been some advancement um, since the originals were believing were made. Um, how do you account for that, or are you using the same type of techniques and tools that uh, would have been used in the past? Well, it's a hammer and a chisel. So it's it, it it's not um, it's not changed massively, right? They're still the sort of same shape. They're not complicated machines. Um, we use slightly different materials. We use tungsten carbide tipped chisels. They we don't have to sharpen them as often, um, but with a high carbon steel chisel and a decent wet stone, you know, a, 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 an ancient uh, stone carver would have been pretty much as fast as I am. So it's not not fundamentally different, and, and anyone who tells you that they didn't have access to steel in the early medieval period doesn't understand how chisels work. Um, it had to be steel and uh, at the point you can produce bellows to make it um, hot enough and charcoal um, to borrow the carbon into the iron, you can produce high carbon steel and we've been doing that for a long, long time. And, and, and you see the same people from the early medieval through to the late medieval, you see the same people commemorated. Uh, on monuments, you see the aristocracy, the, the priests, you see their wives, you see uh, warriors, um, you see certain tradesmen, and, and you see blacksmiths because they know how to make hard iron, right? So if you can make hard iron, you can make steel, uh, you can make sharp swords, and therefore you're important, you're elevated within society. So, um, yeah, they, in answer to your question, they're using pretty much the same things that I use. So, yeah, pretty much the same. Hi, uh, just for a question for Dave there. Um, archaeologically, there's a lot of discussion as to whether the Pictish stones were painted. I was wondering, do you paint any of yours? Or, you know, sometimes, you know, it looks very gaudy, but is it more authentic? Is it not? What's your thoughts on that? Yeah, it's a great question. So, um, yeah, there, there was some, um, uh, uh, Jordan Patrick, I think, is doing the, uh, yes, I, I, I'm sure we've had this conversation before. The, um, there are certainly some pigments being found on, on stones at places like Port Mahomic. My own view is that Pictish stones are, 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 are carved um, in such a way that they don't need to be painted to be seen very well and understood. So my feeling is that some of the stones were probably painted some of the time, 
you know, you can almost envisage a situation where maybe on a feast day or whatever, the stone is painted for that day and it's painted every year. What I'd love to do is a little project at Aberlemno where they've got a little bothy out the back, carve a new Aberlemno Pictish stone and get the kids to gather pigments from within 10 miles of that place and paint it that way and repaint it every year, repaint it differently. It would be fantastic. Yeah. Thank you. Good question. David, you again, please. <laughs> I was just wondering, have you ever thought about uh, pre-metal work and stone work and Neolithic stone carvings and how you might do that? No. <laughs> <laughs> it's worth a shot. <laughs> no, uh, yeah, actually, I probably would do it. give it a shot. Yeah, why not? You know. For Hamish, uh, you've told a lot of nice stories in your paintings. Thanks. Um, what story haven't you told that you want to? What story haven't I told? Uh, I know you've put me on the spot on that one. Uh, <laughs> um, I wanted to continue that series of portraits of um, a Celtic gods and goddesses, but I also, um, you know, I have this radio program, uh, I, I do two hours of music on St Andrew's Day, and uh, I wanted to continue some of the saints as well, and um, there's a lot of um, history and folklore and imagery around St Andrew that I would quite like to do a, a little portrait of him. Um, that's the one that immediately springs to mind. Um, a lot more picture stuff, maybe. Um, my family's from that kind of area and uh, I've got a few tattooed on me actually underneath all this and uh, I don't know uh, and the, the Irish Rover stuff continues to be I, I do all our album covers and each one of them uh, I didn't put them on uh, slide there today Saints and Sinners was a little bit off the wall and some irreverent stuff going on on that one and uh, the last one <coughs> was uh no End in Sight uh, was their last album and uh, that kind of had the uh, world map uh, decorated with Celtic stuff and um, like a, the Voyages of Columbus, it was how the Irish Rovers left here and uh, went over to to Canada and then and into America and uh, little dotted lines showed their journey around the planet doing concerts and stuff so, um, you know, I'm my mainstay these days is, is album covers for those guys and they have no plans of stopping any time soon. I can't stop myself, so <laughs> I have a question for Ruth. Um, I, I, I don't know very much about felting, and, but it seems to me perfectly suited for making interlace because you can make the underlying shadow and then work out your overs and unders and it, it, it seems perfect, perfectly suited. So I w And also very possible to do historically. Do you have evidence of, um, do you know of evidence of, of large scale felting like that from, from the Middle Ages? To be honest, there wasn't really a lot of evidence of felting in the British Isles until maybe the last 30 or 40 years. It's very much a mi Middle Eastern and Far East thing. I mean, the, there's, I believe, archaeological evidence of Roman soldiers putting wool in the soles of their sandals, which, with the sweat from their feet, became felt. So there is some examples of felt from very early on, but it wasn't a sort of, it wasn't a decorative art form in Europe. So, so no, it's, it's a modern phenomenon, really. Thank you. Thank you, some great questions there and some great answers. We've learnt an awful lot today. And 
we've had a, such a variety of uh, information over the last two days about different media and different techniques, historic and modern. So a great finish to, the, to today's talks. And also, having heard about Pictish stones and carving, it's nice to be able to go up to the cathedral now and see some more carved stones. It's a nice, uh, nice follow-on. So I hope you'll all join us uh, to, uh, to thank our speakers this morning and this afternoon. <laughs> and um, if you'd like to collect your things together, um, we'll be here again, obviously, tomorrow morning at uh, 10 for our last session. Um, but I hope you'll join our group as we go up to the cathedral. So as I mentioned, we're going to leave from the uh, entrance, go up the steps again, and then left along the mall and meet at the cathedral. Uh, it'd be nice to be there about three. Um, it'll, you know, you, that's plenty of time, I think, to get up there. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll talk about the, uh, the crosses and architecture of the Hill of Down. So thank you very much. <laughs> no. <laughs>